It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. Welcome aboard. We've got a great show for you today, and we're going to take you back in time, a time that some think of as the golden age of riding for hunters. World War II was over, and the boys we sent over there were coming back home and heading into the woods, into the fields, and into the marshes to hunt deer, pheasants, and ducks as the North American model of conservation and wildlife management started paying dividends Big game and game bird numbers from all sorts of species became more abundant and with the American economy improving in the 50s and 60s, hunters were finding more time and opportunity to go afield with a rifle or shotgun in hand. Many of these hunters read Outdoor Life magazine and a towering influence in the world of big game hunting, both in North America and in Africa, was Jack O'Connor, the shooting editor of this magazine, who was regarded as an accomplished hunter, shooter, teacher, and storyteller. Jack, who lived in Lewiston, Idaho, wrote books, articles, and hunted right up until he passed away in 1978. Today, you'll find the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage and Education Center in Hell's Gate State Park. It's in Lewiston, Idaho, on a hill overlooking the Snake River across the border from southeast Washington. Inside the center, you'll find mounts from all over the world, representing the big game jack shot, and you'll learn about the man behind the typewriter, along with his wife and longtime partner in adventure, Eleanor, who was quite a huntress in her own right. I was lucky enough to attend an anniversary event for this marvelous center. And today, we'll share details about Jack and his legacy as a hunter and writer with you. One person who will shed some more light on Jack, Eleanor, and this center is Shirley Phillips. She's the director of this special place dedicated to the hunting heritage, conservation, and the memory of Jack and Eleanor O'Connor. She's got some stories you're going to want to hear about this couple. Jack took Eleanor on several African safaris, and today, another well-known hunting writer, Wayne Van Swall, is taking women to Africa, too, for hunting expeditions. Wayne is part of a non-profit organization offering ladies the opportunity to go to Africa for an incredibly discounted price you won't believe. Wayne's organization is called High Country Adventures for Women, and no matter what your experience level as a hunter, this is something you as a woman should look into if you want to experience Africa, its hunting, and its model of wildlife conservation up close and personal for a price that's so affordable that you will kick yourself, literally kick yourself, if you don't apply for a chance to go. Now, Jack, as we mentioned, was the shooting editor of Outdoor Life magazine for years and contributed stories about taking everything from leopards to wild sheep during his working life as a hunter and writer. It's fitting, then, that another person who was at this event was Andrew McKean, a fine hunter, adventurer, and storyteller in his own right, and the former editor-in-chief and current editor-at-large for Outdoor Life magazine. We're going to spend some time talking to Andrew about the evolution of this well-known magazine dedicated to hunting with a Western U.S. influence. We'll also talk about Jack's contributions to the craft of outdoor writing in this magazine and how this famous publication and the stories within it have changed over the years. It promises to be a fascinating hour dedicated to an outdoors writer of near-mythic proportions, but also to a legacy that continues on the pages of magazines on the African plains and in the mountains of the American West to this day. Before we talk about hunting in Lewiston, though, we want to talk a little fishing, too. Tyler Ross with Fish Fighter Products, also located in the state of Idaho, will tell you about a really well-thought-out tray for your sinkers you'll want to have on your boat later in the hour. We also thought we ought to introduce you to the president of Visit Lewis and Clark Valley because Lewiston, Idaho and Clarkston, which sits just across the river in Washington, are situated next to a couple of great rivers known for big salmon and steelhead. This is also 
the gateway to North America's deepest gorge, Hell's Canyon, where you can take a jet boat up the Snake River to not only enjoy some incredible adventures, but also get into some fantastic fishing for bass and trophy sturgeon, too. Before we take you to the Jack O'Connor Center, we want to highlight all the outdoors opportunities available here in the Lewis and Clark Valley. And the person who's going to do that with us, with fishing in mind, is Michelle Peters. She's the president of Visit Lewis and Clark Valley. Michelle, great to talk to you again. Well, good afternoon. How are you? I am doing good. And most folks listening today don't know that you are a far better angler than I'll ever be. You catch most of your fish right here around Lewiston, Idaho, Clarkston, Washington, and in Hell's Canyon. And I think just by talking about some of the big fish you've caught, people will get an idea of how good the fishing is. We're going to start off with Chinook salmon. What's the biggest one you've caught out here, and which river was it? Actually, it was a 45-pound salmon in Hell's Canyon. It was a huge monster. It was fun to catch and took quite a while to get in, but I finally did. Yep, and that's about double the size of any freshwater salmon I've ever caught, so that's fantastic. Steelhead? Uh, Steelhead, the Clearwater River, has the larger ones, the B-Run, and it was almost 20 pounds. Also, far above any steelhead I have ever caught. Let's turn our attention to sturgeon. You've got quite the catch-and-release fishery here, and I have caught some big sturgeon, so maybe I'll get close to you on this one. Uh, it was 10 feet. I have a picture in my office that's uh, a trophy that I show people often. Okay, I didn't beat you there either, Michelle. And again, folks, uh, the Snake River in Hell's Canyon is a fantastic trophy sturgeon fishery. And one other thing that a lot of people just don't even think about is this is a great smallmouth bass fishery, too. And they'll get up to three pounds quite often. A lot of them are smaller, but uh, you can catch a lot in a day. Now, I've caught a couple dozen in a day around here, but I'm guessing you might have beat me on that, too. Oh, I think it's probably close to 30 and ranging from 3 to 5 pounds even. They're huge around here. All right. Well, if nothing else, we've established two things. Uh, the greater Lewis and Clark Valley, to include the Clearwater River and the Snake River and Hell's Canyon, is a great fishing destination. And Michelle Peters is a far better fisher person than I'll ever be. Let's talk about current fishing conditions. We're sitting here in June. I know a lot of guides are working the Clearwater for Chinook salmon. How's it been? It's been excellent. This morning, uh, Adam Hawking with Still Dreams Guide Service caught four salmon before noon today. So they limited out. It's one adult salmon per person. That's fantastic. And folks, I, I want to give you a caution here. The fishing is very good right now, but uh, there is a quota and it may be reached by the time you actually hear this interview. So before you get your rods and reels and come out here to the Clearwater River at Lewiston, make sure you check the regs with Idaho Fish and Game. So with that in mind, though, uh, let's turn our attention to the sturgeon fishing. I'm already seeing pictures of big sturgeon uh, from some of the guide services around here. They definitely are. If you look on Facebook every day, they're ranging six to nine feet in length. So it's what they do. They're sturgeon fishing while you're sitting there waiting. They throw out and fish for bass too. So it's a really, it's a great trip, bass and sturgeon in one day. Oh, it really is. And folks, this is all catch and release fun. Uh, the scenery up Hell's Canyon where you're doing this is absolutely fantastic. But you know, even if you're not with a guide, uh, now folks, I don't recommend that you go up in a boat up Hell's Canyon by yourself if you've never done it before, but there's lots of shore access between here and Asotin and all the way down to Heller Bar where folks can get in some good fishing from shore, especially for the smallmouth bass. You really can. It's actually 30 miles of um, shorelines all the way up to Heller Bar, and there's sandy, beautiful beaches. You can go swimming, too, while you're there. On top of all this, you've got some rivers not too far away that are excellent for fishing for trout. There's the Selway for trout. We have so many beautiful rivers around here. Uh, the Selway, absolutely a gorgeous river. I've had the opportunity to fish that. Uh, bring your fly rod for that one or your spinning rod. You're going to catch some cutthroat up there. Bottom line is this, Lewiston, Idaho, Clarkston, Washington, perfect place for a base camp for a fishing vacation. What's the website so folks can find out more? It's visitlcvalley.com. That's visitlcvalley.com. Visitlcvalley.com. Uh, this area is right on the border of Idaho and Washington in the southeast corner of Washington State. 
tons of fishing opportunities. We didn't even get into the steelhead fishing that happens later in the fall or the hunting opportunities around here as well. We will save that for another time. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Michelle, on America Outdoors Radio. Thanks, John. Why book at Sportsman's Cove Lodge? Why is Alaska like no other place on earth? It hasn't changed in thousands of years. From the way you get here on a float plane to the way you go out with the guides and the boats, it's just a professional experience. And I said, this is as good as it gets. I said, if you can't catch fish here, you can't catch fish anywhere. Your experience with us will leave you speechless. Book now at alaskasbestlodge.com. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here for you. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. Hurry, though. If you wait too long, the big opportunity might just get away. AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. You're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We're actually in Lewiston, Idaho at the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage and Education Center. We're talking to the director. Her name is Shirley Phillips. Shirley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Wonderful to have all of you here. I'm so glad that you invited not only me, but a number of other outdoors writers, firearms writers, uh, for this anniversary event. And I want to spend some time telling our listeners a little bit about Jack O'Connor and the Hunting Heritage and Education Center. So why don't we start off with Jack himself. You know, this is a beautiful center that you have here. Jack O'Connor, arguably the, the most famous firearms and hunting writer of the 20th century, firearms editor for Outdoor Life, wrote a number of books hunted all over North America and Africa, and the trophies are here. This place is something else. We think it's gorgeous, and we're so glad to be the trustees of that collection that he, both Jack and his wife Eleanor, amassed over their lifetime. So a lot of people are probably thinking, scratching their heads, well, why is this center located in Little Lewiston, Idaho? Well, Jack and Eleanor moved here and lived the last 30 years of their life here in Lewiston. And it's kind of a funny story as to how they ended up in Lewiston. Jack was very good friends with um, Spear, and Spear had his bullet factory here in Lewiston. Jack was living in Tucson at the time, went out after work one day to his favorite place to hunt quail, and there was one other car there. And he came back and told Eleanor, that's it. We're out of here. It's just way too crowded. <laughs> Called Vernon Spear and said, find me a house. I'm moving to Lewiston, Idaho. And that he did. That is funny. And I guess that brings up something else. Jack, people always associate him as a big game hunter, uh, but he was an upland bird hunter, too, and a duck hunter. That's true. That's true. We have photographs of him taking his kids pheasant hunting right here in Lewiston. So Jack was born in 1902. Passed away in 1978, like you said, lived for 30 years here. Uh, and something else that I think is really interesting is though Jack had all this fame, his wife, Eleanor, she was just as much of a huntress as he was a hunter. That's very true. And it wasn't something that she grew up with. It truly came when they got married and she saw his interest and she wanted to join him. And I'm told that in many cases she might have been a better shot than Jackie. But. <laughs> 
Uh, that would not surprise me. It's just the the women versus men thing, and that wouldn't surprise me a bit. A, a little bit more about Jack. I love the collection here. I mean, it's got not just his trophies, not just his firearms, but it's got his typewriters. It's got the the tools of his trade, his cameras and the uh, his binoculars, uh, other things he used as an outdoors writer uh, and as a as a media professional. And he kind of pioneered the the whole concept of being a celebrity outdoors person, didn't he? That's very true. And I'm always touched by the stories that visitors bring when they come into the center. And so many of them that are, and eh, they're probably in retirement age, and they grew up waiting at the mailbox for the next issue of Outdoor Life to read Jack's articles. And I have a relative who said that he grew up here in Lewiston, never had left Lewiston. When he was 16 years old, he felt like he'd traveled the world just by reading Jack's articles. And that's a a theme we hear so frequently from our visitors. Jack had a huge impression on their lives. Well, not only that, uh, but I understand from, from talking to you before we went on the microphone here, you have visitors from literally all over America that come here. Uh, and, and for some of them, it's a real bucket list deal to see this center. Most definitely. We have them from Florida to Alaska to the New England area, and they want to make sure that they see this. a lot of them. Their favorite thing to, that they've read about is either Jack's Grand Slam or the famous 270 that Al Beeson built for him. So we have that firearm here. As a matter of fact, I I want to talk about both real quick. And again, folks, we're talking to Shirley Phillips. She's the director of the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage and Education Center located in Lewiston, Idaho, in Hell's Gate State Park. And the 270 Winchester, uh, he really popularized that to the point where that's the only deer rifle that my dad shot and said that's the only firearm you ever need. And for a, a whole generation of Americans, he really espoused that theory, and, and a lot of folks bought into it. That's so true, and that's a, another story I hear all the time. My father would only use a 270. I have only shot a 270, and it's the best. And he really did espouse that theme and uh, wrote so eloquently about his travels with the 270, even into areas and hunting animals that... Most people probably wouldn't have used a 270, but he proved it was the all that was needed. Yes, he did. And, and, you know, credit to him for that. You mentioned the Grand Slam. Now, there's a lot of people who, are, when they think Grand Slams, they think turkey, they think deer. Uh, but that's not the Grand Slam we're talking about with Jack O'Connor, is it? No, his is a Grand Slam of wild sheep. And that includes everything from bighorn sheep down in the southwest uh, to stone and doll sheep up in far north of North America. Uh, And they're they're all right here. I mean, I'm I'm literally looking through the window and, and looking at them right now. Magnificent mounts. That's so true. That's so true. Probably the most significant is the pilot ram that he uh, took on Pilot Mountain, which I believe is in the Yukon. And... um, He wrote about it in an article in 1952 in Outdoor Life, and uh, it was about a two-week adventure. And, you know, when you think about the times when Jack was traveling to these really remote areas, you didn't fly there and then just top off the plane and go hunting. It was a trek to get there by car, by horsepack, on foot, um, when he went to Africa and Asia, I mean, it was by ship and then train, and, you know, it was it was an ordeal. Well, not only that, I'm looking at some of these mounts, and I'm looking at the dates they were taken. I mean, he's doing sheep hunts, which is some of the most demanding hunting that there is. He's doing it in his 60s. Oh, definitely, definitely. No, he uh, hunted and traveled up till the actual date that he died. He was on his way home from Hawaii by ship when he passed away. 
we could go on a lot longer, but unfortunately we're starting to run out of time here. So the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage Center, this this whole center dedicated to the, the memory and the story and, and everything that Jack O'Connor and his wife Eleanor accomplished in the field of hunting, in the field of firearms, and in conservation too, I might add. What are the days and the hours it's open? During the summer, we are open seven days a week from 10 to 4 during the week and on weekends from 1 to 4. And during the winter hours, just check our website at jack-o'connor.org. That's jack-o'connor, with an O at the end of O'Connor there, dot org. That's jack-o'connor.org. Make plans uh, to visit Lewiston, Idaho. We already told you about the great fishing around here and exploring Hell's Canyon earlier in the show, and you definitely have to stop by the Jack O'Connor Center and see everything that this American icon has contributed to hunting here in the United States and throughout the world. Shirley, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Our pleasure. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you. It doesn't matter what sort of adventure you're after, whether it's big game deep in the backcountry, a day of fishing out in the water, or an overnight in the great outdoors. At Sportsman's Warehouse, we've got the gear in here for what you need out there. Gear up for your next adventure at one of its Sportsman's Warehouse stores or shop online. Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. Tillamook Bay is considered the greatest fishing experience on the west coast for fall Chinook salmon and winter steelhead, and Dungeness crab is plentiful. Five major rivers connect with the ocean on the Tillamook coast. It's not unusual to snag a 40 to 50 pounder. Go out in a boat or stand on a river bank or dock. Try fishing from a dory boat and experience the thrill of a beach launch and landing. Use spinners, sand shrimp, or salmon eggs to lure them. The fish will line up to grab your bait. Go to TillamookCoast.com backslash fishing to find guides and places to stay. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We're broadcasting from the Jack O'Connor Heritage and Education Center in Lewiston, Idaho. And I, along with several other outdoors writers, have been invited here at the invitation of a very well-known outdoors writer and a board member for the center. His name is Wayne Van Swall. Wayne, thank you so much for the invitation. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, John. Delighted to have you here. Well, it's been very entertaining, been a lot of fun, been educational too, but you are doing something that I want to share with our listeners, and this is especially for our female listeners who may or may not have a whole lot of experience in hunting. You are actually organizing low-cost trips to take women to Africa on safari. Tell our listeners more about this. Well, it began in the uh, 1990s when I was doing my doctoral work in Utah, and I was guiding elk hunters in the fall. One of the women asked if I would uh, conduct an, uh, an outdoor skills school for women, and uh, from that evolved uh, a program that we held for two years in Utah and then in Wyoming, uh, teaching archery, rifle, pistol, shotgun, black powder, shooting, fly fishing, orienteering, horseback riding, that sort of thing, to a safari in Africa because I wanted these women to get some hunting experience. And as you probably know, hunting in the uh, in the western United States is getting a little complicated these days yes, with big, big game draws and, and that sort of thing. And a week or so in Africa, hunting plains game gives you much more experience uh, for the dollar. And let's talk about the dollar. You know, I've priced an African safari before, thought I was getting a good deal until I started adding up the costs. I mean, this can be anywhere from a $10,000 to $25,000 proposition to go to Africa for a week or 10 days. Uh, that's correct, John. And that was too much money. I was not looking for people uh, to go who would otherwise go on their own or be hosted by their husbands or, or boyfriends. I wanted to offer women an experience with other women that would introduce them to hunting 
hunting and show them the link between hunting and conservation, give them a, a, a real hands-on experience with a rifle in the field and, and offer them a, a safari at a, a real reasonable price. And so I got together with a couple of professional hunters, uh, one in Namibia and one in South Africa with whom I'd hunted before and who also had the same uh, goal or mission in mind and would do this at essentially uh, cost. So this is a not-for-profit effort. Uh, I don't make anything. The outfitter really doesn't make anything over the cost of running the operation. And uh, we've been able to host groups of four to six women for, t for eight days of hunting uh, for about 25 to $2,700 dollars. Hold years. on, hold on. I didn't hear that right because uh, my mind's still stuck on ten to twenty five thousand dollars. How much for an eight day hunt in Africa for these women? Uh, this year it was twenty six hundred, and uh, that includes everything once you land in Africa. So it includes the trophy fees for four animals. Which hold on. <laughs> Hold on. This can't be right. This can't be right. <laughs> Trophy fees for four animals, all your food, all your accommodations, hunting with a professional hunter, the whole kit and caboodle, $2,600? That's correct, John. And we wanted to do it as a package because we're, we're not looking, again, for experienced hunters. Some of these women do have experience hunting in the States, whitetail hunting, for example, or turkey hunting. But many of them have no experience hunting. And even for those who have hunted in the U.S., hunting in Africa is different. As you probably know, there there are no license fees most places, but there are trophy fees. Once you pull the trigger, then, then you owe a fee for that animal and it can range from a few hundred dollars to many thousands. Thousands. Now, we didn't want to spring any surprises or have any additional costs. I don't like to have things added on to a package that I've bought. So we decided that once we landed in Africa, the package was complete. And for four animals, which include kudu, gemsbuck, red hartebeest, blue wildebeest, black wildebeest, big antelopes that typically cost a substantial sum, uh, we would allow the women to take those animals and a few others uh, on the list, four of them, within that package fee. These are not, pardon the phrase, these are not junk animals that you sometimes see for very low trophy fees. These are sought-after animals. They are, and we wanted it to be a, a hunting experience where those would be, well, I guess, as appealing to the women as they are to us, us men who hunt Africa often. So what's your target audience, and what's your specific mission here? Again, you're offering these very low-cost African safaris. I know there's a lot of boyfriends or husbands who are saying, can I tag along? And I know the answer is no. Don't even try, guys. Uh, so give me the, the typical woman that goes on one of these hunts in terms of, you know, her age, experience level, and, and, and how you open her eyes to the African experience and what she brings back. Sure. Well, what she brings back is important to us because this is obviously partly to give the women a good time in Africa. But I guess the mission here, if you want to put it that way, is to show women how conservation Conservation depends on hunting and how hunting works in Africa very openly to benefit conservation. Also, we want the women who might not otherwise experience it to find an animal in their sights and make that decision whether to shoot or not. We never tell women you have to shoot four animals or to shoot even to shoot one, but we want them to be experienced as hunters, experienced spotting of game, the stalk, uh, the chase, the opportunity to shoot. You know, when, when women ask me, oh, gosh, do I have to shoot something? And that has come up. I said, look, if you're, if you're really opposed to hunting, it's probably not the safari for you. But if you have an open mind, I can tell you this. You can't know what it is like to be a hunter or a predator until you've seen an animal in your sight. Then you know. Whether you kill the animal or not, you, you know what it is. And then you can talk intelligently about it and form your own views about it. We don't push our views on you. But you can't watch a National Geographic special on African Plains game and know what it is like to hunt Plains game. So you've had these women that have had this conversation with you. They've gone with you to Africa. Uh, do they generally pull the trigger? I mean, are there, are there women that just decide, no, I'm not going to pull the trigger at all? We, we've had some who doubted their willingness to pull the trigger before they came. Every woman who has gone with us, and there are dozens over the last 13 years, we've been at this 13 years now, every one of them has shot at least one animal. Many have shot all four that we've allowed, 
and uh, beyond the experience, you know, that's up to the women. What surprised me, though, John, on these trips is is how quickly the women bonded as a group. They come from, you've asked about backgrounds, many different backgrounds. We've had women as young as 27, as old as 78, and, and they have all had a good time, and they have all gotten along really well. They've bonded much quicker than men I've seen in hunting camps <laughs> who, who can't wait to take their guide aside and say, look, can you show me your honey hole, you know, <laughs> or I have to get a bigger elk than this right, guy, you know, right. that just doesn't happen with the women. In fact, some of them have actually refused hunting opportunity themselves to ensure that somebody else in their particular land cruiser that day had the opportunity. We had one woman whose rifle, we don't have this happen very often, but his rifle was delayed in in transit. It was actually sent from Minnesota to Arizona instead of from Minnesota to Africa. Oh. Well, they, but they both start with A, sure, right? Sure. <laughs> but uh, she was without a rifle three days, and, and the third day I said, look, Kathy, I, I'd love for you to borrow my rifle. I don't want you to, because yes, we've seen lots of game, but that's no promise guarantee right. that we'll see it the next three days she said no i'm having so much fun watching other people shoot and other watching other people hunt participating i'm just not pulling the trigger but i'm still having a great time well then the fourth day her rifle arrived and she killed three animals with three shots in two days you know it was i love a happy ending we are actually already out of time but before we go uh let's give people a website i guess the the next question is how many openings do you have for next year, 2019? Are you taking applications? And, and what's the website for people to go to and apply? Sure. John, we take, again, four to six people, and there are openings for 2019. <clears throat> I have a website. It's called highcountrywomen.com, a one word. And on that uh, website, you'll find my email address, which is wvanswall at amerion.com and you can contact me they can contact me at any time regarding the safari i'd be happy to explain more as you might imagine hearing this price and this experience for the price uh, a lot of you are probably going to want in on this so there's no guarantee you're going to get in again there's limited spots but if you're interested the website again is highcountrywomen.com that's highcountrywomen.com for an incredible African safari experience at a price you'll never ever see again. Wayne, thanks for doing this and introducing women to Africa and safaris on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you very much, John. Hi, I'm Craig Boddington. I've written about hunting for 40 years, much of it in bear country. I trust my life to bear spray because the research is in. It stopped bears 92% of the time and prevented injury 98% of the time. Bear spray requires less accuracy and won't harm your companions or the bear. Carry bear spray in bear country. Keep it accessible and practice. I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to our show. It's Sportsman's Cove Lodge and many anglers who have been there will tell you it really is Alaska's best lodge. Sportsman's Cove Lodge sits on a salmon highway full of kings and silvers. There's halibut too, and there are some really big ones. Finally, with decades of experience taking care of customers, Sportsman's Cove Lodge knows how to treat you right from start to finish. Ready to book your trip of a lifetime? Then call Sportsman's Cove Lodge at 800-962-7889. That's 800-962-7889. 800-962-7889 for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer an affordable platform to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting host John Cruz through his website at AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. But hurry, if you wait too long, this big opportunity might just get away. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. There's no more majestic, magical, adventuresome country than the western United States of America to enjoy a great family vacation. 
Hello, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. Shiloh Inns are still offering affordable four-star accommodations at two-star prices. Enjoy deluxe smoke-free suites, spacious pools and spas, and fully equipped fitness centers. From free high-speed internet in every room to a free continental breakfast or full hot delicious breakfast at most Shiloh Inns. There are no hidden fees like some of the big chain hotels charge. Even the kids stay free and Shiloh Inns are dog friendly. For reservations, call 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at ShilohInns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American family owned and proud of it. Backcountry hunters and anglers, a nationwide group working to keep public lands in public hands. We've helped ban the use of drones for hunting. We help repair wildlife corridors and key riparian areas. We speak up against illegal ATV use. Please join this dynamic conservation group. Check us out at backcountryhunters.org. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. This portion of the show is brought to you by Fish Fighter Products. They're based in Idaho, the same state we're broadcasting from this week. And they make great gear for your fishing boat that lets you spend more time fishing and less time fumbling around for the things you need to fish. One such item that is made specifically for this purpose is their sinker tray. And with us here to tell you more about it is Tyler Ross from Fish Fighter Products. Tyler, great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. A sinker tray. You know, usually there's a a little side area in a boat where people throw their sinkers. Or maybe they've got a, a tackle box full of sinkers or whatever it may be. And you're literally rummaging through this space looking for the right sinker and again it's it's a time waster and a lot of times those numbers that tell you how much the sinker weighs well they've rubbed off and the sinkers are similar size so you're really fumbling and stumbling around trying to figure out the right weight to use you've solved that with your sinker tray haven't you yeah, we're, we're very proud of our sinker trays. I mean, one thing that, that a lot of anglers will tell you is when you're fishing rocky terrain, especially areas of the Columbia, even the Snake River, what we realize is that with, with your weight, the printed weight will, will at times wear off. And, and what happens is it's really hard to discern between a, a four and a, and a six because they're very similar in size. So our anchor trays allow you to size these efficiently, keep them together. And also, it kind of forces you to be organized because those, those sizes on top of our sinker trays just kind of get you to put the, the weight back where it's supposed to go instead of, you know, in, in the, the rush of catching fish, getting your weights mixed up, which then again makes it difficult to, to change rigs if you have different water flows or, or you know, different, different fishing situations. And for those of you listening, let me describe this. Essentially, there's a little slot above the tray and in each little sub portion of the tray, you have one of these slots. And so the four ounce sinker, fits into one, the six ounce sinker fits in the other, and the six ounce sinker is not going to fit in the four ounce sinker. So it really forces you to stay organized. So when you need that weight, that particular weight for that particular project that you're working on on the water, and you have to have that four ounce weight or six ounce weight, you know exactly where to go in your tray to get it. No more rummaging around. Again, it's all about efficiency. It's all about spending more time on the water fishing. Now, fishfighterproducts.com is the website to go to to get the sinker tray. And I know that you sell primarily direct to consumer on fishfighterproducts.com, but You've got some dealers, including a big one in the Portland, Oregon area. Yeah, we, we have a partnership with Stevens Marine, so they do have a retail presence for us. This time, they're one of our one of our top dealers, so we're very excited about it. So for all of our listeners today, tuning in on AM 1640, The Patriot out of Portland, Oregon, Stevens Marine is the place to go to get the sinker tray and all sorts of other accessories from Fish Fighter Products. As for everyone else... Just go to fishfighterproducts.com, making your life on the water easier so you can spend more time fishing. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you so much, John. 
Next on America Outdoors Radio, we've got one more interview for you from the Jack O'Connor Center in Lewiston, Idaho. It's with Andrew McKean. He's the former editor-in-chief for Outdoor Life magazine. Now he's the editor-at-large. And I wanted to talk to you today, Andrew, a little bit about the history of outdoor life and about Jack O'Connor's contribution to it. Let's start off with the magazine itself. It's been around a lot longer than I thought. 1898 is when it was founded in Denver, Colorado. So, what's that, 121 years now. Give or take. And and something else that you said last night, you gave a presentation at the banquet, was how you described outdoor life. And, and, and if you're willing to do so on the air, I'd love to hear that again. So the setup for this is Field and Stream and Outdoor Life are owned by the same media company. I have been for 40 years. So there's a great, strong, and friendly rivalry between the two titles. What we've always said is Field and Stream... Now, of course, this is an outdoor life perspective. Of course. Field and Stream is the, is the magazine for the people who someday think they might want to hunt and shoot. And Outdoor Life is for the people who actually do it. <laughs> I love it. And again, folks, uh, this is a biased opinion from the editor at Outdoor Life. But, but one thing that I've always enjoyed about Outdoor Life magazine, and you've mentioned this before, and I've certainly seen it in the editorial content, it's truly a magazine of the West, isn't it? It is. You know, it, it's a nationally distributed magazine, but its heart and soul, and I, I think a lot of its DNA, is in the West. Part of it's its origin story. It's from Denver. Last night, I kind of went through the, the tracing some of that origin with really a Western sort of fixation. You look at a lot of the early covers, and there's mountains and kind of people doing manly things in mountains. But it is. It, it, it has a real Western feel and focus to the degree that, you know, now if you're a magazine in America, you... You salute Father Whitetail. I mean, this is what drives everything we do. But we still, at Outdoor Life, have a real West lean in terms of, you know, there's you're more likely to see an elk story, a bighorn sheep story. And, you know, coming here and kind of connecting the dots with the Jack O'Connor legacy is he was a consummate Westerner. You know, an Arizona native, obviously moved here, was sort of synonymous with the big Western adventure. Well, and you might say that Jack O'Connor is synonymous with outdoor life, at least to a generation. I mean, he wrote from the 1930s until the 1970s during the heyday of this magazine. And I think it would be fair to say that the stories he wrote then are a little bit different than the stories we read in not just outdoor life, but any hunting magazine today. Jack O'Connor was the king and really the godfather of what we now call the come along adventure. I've always said about any piece of content needs to do one of four things. It needs to educate, inform, inspire, but it also needs to transport. And Jack O'Connor was the king of taking you to the places that he went. He transported you there. Of those four things, I think we've really lost that in terms of the short sort of how-to tactical magazine piece. And one of the things I think is really so interesting about being back in sort of Jack O'Connor's shadow here is there is still a real appetite for that come-along adventure. I want to be transported. Take me with you in a place I'll never go myself. And that, I think, is our obligation as magazine producers and editors. We need to transport people. Outdoor Life has gone from being a monthly magazine to uh, bi-monthly magazine, to now a quarterly magazine. And I'll, I'll be honest, the first edition, there was a lot of these come-along stories. There were a lot of these adventures by some very good writers in there. Yeah, so one of the, I guess, transitional phases with Outdoor Life is this is it's getting to the place that I frankly wanted to be a couple of years ago, and that is I think there's still a great place for magazines uh, in America and in the sporting world. But I feel like we're doing a disservice to an audience when we're giving them sort of short, really punchy how The USA things. Today style of right. content, where it's just so short that it's, it's like eating a Nilla wafer or, uh, you know, a couple French fries. There's nothing to it. We call that potato chip content, so you're exactly right. So the great thing about the quarterly is you've got what I call a, a sit-back experience. So if you think about that short stuff, it's almost leaning forward into your phone that you're, you're leaning into that next thing so you don't have much time. Magazines, I think, best serve their audience when they produce a sit-back experience. You've got time to be transported. And the quarterly format, I hope, we'll see how it goes, has longer features, bigger pictures, more opportunity to transport. And so that, to me, is, the, is kind of a gift to the readership. Unfortunately, it's also a function of the economy. It's hard to, to sell 12 issues and even 10 issues and 6 issues uh, to advertisers now. But I really feel like this is the niche that serious magazines need to look at is – Bring a reader along, but have them lean back into the experience. Well, being the editor at large, I hope that you're going to be on assignment somewhere exciting in the very near future. Any adventures in the near future for you that you want to share? 
Yeah, actually, the next issue of Outdoor Life, I'm going to transport you to Spain, up to the Pyrenees. We're going to hunt ibex with a crossbow. In the fall issue, I'm going to take you to Quebec. Last year was the last season for hunting caribou in Quebec, which is really just a fixture of the North American big game hunting scene. It's gone now. So I went there to participate in the very last season. And it's not necessarily an uplifting story, but it's definitely transportive. And it really asks the question, what happened to this population wildlife that was thought to be so big it could never be in decline and now it's in serious decline. So one of the things I committed to as the editor at large is to have a feature in issue and I hope it achieves that very thing. I could get to take you to places um, and really have you experience what I do. Well, I certainly enjoy your writing. I know hundreds of thousands of other Americans do too and I look forward to these adventures and thank you for sharing Jack O'Connor's legacy with Outdoor Life with us too on America Outdoors Radio. Well, I am so happy to be here with you, John. This is, a, you know, this is really the soul of the American sportsman right here in this Jack O'Connor Center. Nice to be here with you. I really hope you've enjoyed our show today, and I'd like to thank our great guests as well. If you want to visit the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage and Education Center in Lewiston, Idaho, your first stop should be their website. You'll find it at Jack Dash O'Connor.org. And if you're looking for places to stay, eat, and things to do outdoors, whether it be fishing, taking a jet boat ride into Hell's Canyon, or hunting an area full of opportunities in the Lewis and Clark Valley, look no further than visit lcvalley.com. One place you can always hear us on Saturday mornings is online at 6 a.m. Eastern Time on talkamericaradio.us. And if you missed part of our show, you can always catch up a few days later. Just look for our podcast. You'll find them by going to America Outdoors Radio on Stitcher or Podbean. I hope this broadcast has inspired you to pick up a rifle or shotgun and spend some time afield thinking maybe of your parents or generations before you that did the same thing. I also hope you're blessed in the days ahead. And until we get to spend time with each other again, do remember, it is your country and your outdoors. (laughs) 